come to you now asking that you would just orchestrate, Lord, the remainder of this service. Lord, we've had such a privilege to worship you and, Lord, to appeal to you, Lord, in your goodness and the love that we just spoke of and our praises of what you do, Lord, and our petitions and our desires, Lord, for our own lives and the ones we love and care about. And Lord, how good it is to know that you hear and you care and you answer. And so, Lord, now I just ask as we continue that that heart that we've had through worship, through prayer, through praise, Lord, would remain. And Lord, that we would be sharp and focused even in this late part of morning, Lord, as we open your word and ask you to shine a light on what you've written, Lord. Write it on our hearts today, Lord. Expand our minds, refresh our spirits, Lord. Remind us why we even care to follow you. Lord, you are so good. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Wednesday night, as we were continuing through Leviticus, I was making a point of showing at least a couple examples, because I believe it to be important, of God's signature on his word. A signature I picture, at least in my own mind and from my own heart, that he signs with his hand, with his mighty right hand. And there's so many evidences, and I, and I like pointing to them because as important as the word is and as much as the word pierces us deeply, sometimes it's just neat to show those little things about the word that go, wow, wow, God structured his word like that. And I spoke how God's signature is in the Hebrew and in the language and the way that he he wrote it, and it, it, can't be, it can't be reproduced by man. It can't be reduced by man's technology. They have tried. They can't do it. But a very simple illustration I gave, and I want to repeat it now because it speaks really to my heart, the theme for today's chapter. And one of the things I shared, and it's interesting because we talk often about the Bible and how it was written and the scribes and those modern people that took the Bible and made it what we have on our laps today. And it's divided into books. And many of them were not divided as such in the original text. We have chapters that are numbered. We have, we have verses that are numbered. And sometimes a teacher will, from the front will say, well, understand that these weren't there in the original text. And in most cases, they're arbitrary. In a lot of cases, they're not even what we would feel are accurate because it seems that where a chapter ends, it shouldn't have. Maybe it should have gone a little further into the next chapter. And, you know, but then I look at things like the book of Revelation. I look at the book of Revelation as 22 chapters. It's the capstone, the alpha and the omega, the beginning from the end. And the Hebrew language contains 22 letters, 22 numbers. It's a complete system. And I go, well, you know, this is God's word. Why didn't he have authority over where the numbers went? Was it really, did we really get away with something? And the thing I shared Wednesday night that I want to share really fast right now is that, you know, if we took Psalm 118, that's preceded by the shortest chapter in the Bible, it's followed by the longest chapter in the Bible, and if we took that Psalm 118 and we went backwards to the beginning in Genesis and forward to the end of Revelation, we would find that prior to Psalm 118 and after Psalm 118, there's exactly 594 verses, both directions. And 594 plus 594, and I had to use my calculator, was 1,188. 1188 or 1188 which is interesting because when you come to the middle chapter of the Bible and you let that number of 1188 speak to us and we go in that chapter to 1188 which would be the middle a center verse to the center chapter not the very center verse but it speaks very simply and that verse says this it is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man And if I had to give the most simple summary, other than Jesus loves me, this I know, is that verse right there. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. And I believe this chapter that we have before us in Philippians chapter 3 this morning will speak from that aspect. And really, it speaks to us beyond that about joy. 
And if we're to understand joy, true joy, then our focus can only be on the Lord. But here's what we need to know, and we need to be honest about this right now as we come into this chapter. In so many ways, in so many directions in our lives, with many titles, under many categories, that's not where our focus is at. Our focus is on the things of man. The way we define ourselves, the way we organize our lives, the things we find important, the directions we go, the things we chase after, the loyalties we have, those people and things that we serve are almost entirely those of man. And this morning, at least, if not from this morning onward, we need to stop. And I I use that word on purpose. We need to stop. We need to stop and realize that that joy that we've been promised doesn't come because we have our focus everywhere else. And I don't think anything is becoming clearer to me in these last days of where my focus needs to be. Have I achieved it? Not by far. But I'm struggling to. I'm striving to. And, and some people say, we're not to strive. Well, I'm striving to. I'm striving to. And I hope we all do as well. You know, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 17 and 18, Paul said this. He said, yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. So Paul says he is rejoicing and he's glad because he's poured out his life in service to the Lord. And then he says, for the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. For what reason? For the reason of service. You know, you can speak to anyone that's had the privilege to go into the mission field, whether it's a short term or long term. And I love when I would take a youth group into the mission field. And it was always a theme before and after how we had prepared and we were going to minister to the people that we were going to meet. And inevitably, every time I would say, every time we would come back and the stories were the same. We went to minister, but yet we were ministered to. And I don't know why that seems to happen in the field as opposed to at home. I guess it's the fact that we go into the field and we leave our homes and we have a different perspective and we're not swallowed up by the things of where we live and the culture we're in and the daily routine. And that right there should speak to us about what we need to strip off and shake away so that we can experience those things here as well. Not to say we shouldn't go afar, but the fact is we don't have to go afar to feel and to see and to experience those things I've heard it said, and I've experienced myself, that if you feel that you need, that you're in a position to be ministered to, then go minister to someone else. Because that's where you'll find the blessing. If we just sit and we wait for someone to minister to us, we miss it. And Paul's saying, that's where I find my joy, in the ministering, in the service. And for the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice. And then we come into chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. So there's those words, that word rejoice. And he says rejoice in the Lord. And really that's a four-word statement that could summarize much of what our Christianity is to be. Rejoicing in the Lord. And you know, that's really in contrast to something that we also saw in chapter 2. Chapter 2, verse 14 said, Do all things without complaining or disputing. It's really hard for those two things to coexist. To complain and dispute and find joy. It's usually the lack of joy in whatever is before us that causes the complaining and the disputing. But if we start with the joy in mind, then hopefully the disputing and the whatever words you want to use in that, the grumbling, the complaining is laid by the wayside. And then Paul goes on to even answer why. Why no complaining? Why no disputing? And I guess by extension, why rejoice in the Lord? And he does so there and also in chapter 2, verse 15 and 16, that you may become blameless and harmless, 
children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain, that we might be found blameless and harmless, without fault, in the midst of this generation. That's a tough order. Because this is a crooked and perverse generation. And I could go around the room and almost every one of you could list something that would fit when you look out onto this generation, this culture, that you would have to classify as perverse and, and crooked. But it says, hold fast the word of life. And that's where the difference comes. You know, you hear stories of people that have been in storms, maybe taken by surprise in a tornado or a hurricane. And they've had to hold on to something that's solidly anchored for their dear life, not to be swept away by the storm. Well, we don't have to be surprised by the storm that's overcoming us right now. Truth be told, that's a bad use of the word. It should not overcome us. But if we cling to the very word of life, then we are anchored to something that's immovable. And whatever fights against us to tear away from it will not, will not have its way. He says here, for me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but it is safe. Which means it's for our safety. 2 Peter 1, verse 12, Peter said, For this reason I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know are established in the present truth. That's why we go through the word over and over again. I mean, if you stick around long enough, the Lord doesn't come back soon enough, then we might find ourselves back in Philippians again. In all the other books that we've been through in the last four years here, that's okay. Because there's no reason we shouldn't repeat it. Because if you're like me, you get entertained by the fact it's so fresh and new every time. Every time it speaks to us differently. Every time it says more. Not that it changes, we've changed and we need to be changed And it's ready to change us. So he's saying here, I never get tired of telling you these things. And I do it to safeguard your faith. So he's giving a warning and he's giving a solution built in. If you're listening to the entirety of this chapter. But I think the warning is there because our joy can be ripped off. There are things that are going to strive to steal away the goodness of our faith. And we could find ourselves totally out of joy, never finding joy, because we've been swept away by them. But we need to hold on to cling to, as I said, to the word itself. And then he begins the warning, verse 2, he says, Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. So this warning that comes is kind of uncharacteristic for this letter, because this letter tends to be a joyful, positive letter. But you know, when you speak into the life or someone speaks into your life or you speak into your own life by the word of God or accept what God's telling you, very often it's in the joy that we need the warning. We need to be cautioned. Because usually it's in those moments of joy that we get lax, we get lazy. We feel so good that we might as well not continue on in our disciplines because, well, right now who needs them? Things are good. But that's exactly when we need to buckle up. It's when we need to armor up. Because there's things waiting to steal that joy very quickly. So he's speaking to what kills our joy in the Lord. And that is this, that we dwell too often on the external. We're looking away from the indwelling Lord where our joy should be found. Also, you would add to this legalism. You would add what we often call religion. Understanding that we have a faith. Our faith is alive because it's in someone who is alive. It's full of love because it's in someone who loves us. And we need to be careful when religiosity tries to stifle that. When legality tries to stifle that. Tries to make us something that we don't have to be. Force us to do things in such a way that may fit a system. May fit a denomination. May fit a church. And I'm not talking about traditions that are healthy and fun and that, that, that build us up. I'm talking about the things that drag us down, that box us in, that limit us from that God that is alive, 
that wants to spend time with us. He uses the word here, dogs, which is really speaking of the legalists, but it's a great picture. Because legalists, they, 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 they run in packs. They, they tend to prowl. They feed on refuse and filth. They fight among themselves and they attack passers-by. And so we don't want to deal with a pack of dogs within the life of our faith. And we definitely don't want to be those dogs either. And so we need to come to an understanding and an appreciation and a worship of the freedom that we're given in Christ. But see, I don't think we ever will come to the full love of our freedom unless we truly believe how enslaved we were and how enslaved the world is. Because it is. It is so enslaved. And those that don't know the Lord are enslaved to that world. You know, a legalist really brings a heavy hand, a heavy hand of truth without spirit. And Jesus told me to worship him in spirit and truth. It's a balance. We need truth, but we have to have the spirit. Because without that balance, we're, we're, we're just too far at each end. Too far, and we're, we're at extremes. And, is it, and it, we're not to be at extremes. We're to be at a balanced place before the Lord. Because if we just have all truth, no spirit, then we have the word applied without love. And then it just becomes cruel and heavy-handed. So what do we see legalists do very often? Well, they talk about works. They talk about righteousness that a man's ways bring about, man's wisdom. And it also starts to bring in fads and props. And as Paul said in Ephesians, every wind of doctrine. The only doctrine we need is what's before us in the word of God, the truth. He also warns about evil workers. And if you look into the language there, the Greek, it's really talking about teachers of evil. And we need to be careful about that word evil. And I just said it to someone this morning in a conversation. I've said it often over the years, and I believe it with my whole being, that we don't get how evil evil is. We just don't. We talk about it. We can intellectualize it. We can give examples of evil. It's funny. People that don't believe in God believe in evil. There's people that believe in the devil that don't believe in God. People see evil. They, They know evil. That's why Jesus talked more about hell than he did about heaven. But we need to understand that evil exists and there are those that teach it, but it's so subtle. It's not always what you would call evil. Sometimes it looks right. It looks interesting. It looks fun, just like sin. And it is all those things for a season, but it leads to destruction. So we need to balance everything against the word of God. He warns here, beware of the mutilation. And really, that's a great contrast with circumcision. Because in circumcision, we see a cutting away of the flesh as a mark. And it's God-ordained. But there was also a mutilation being done amongst the pagans. It was man-derived for man's purposes. And God, in, in Paul speaking about the difference between mutilation and circumcision, that we're not to do these things in the way that the pagans do. In Leviticus 21.5 says, They shall not make any cutting in their flesh. And he was speaking to what the pagans did. Even though he would bring this cutting of the flesh away in as a mark that they belong to him. And again, those four words, rejoice in the Lord. Shift our focus away from man. Shift our focus away from the things that man does and man says is right. And we're in a day now that we are being inundated with what man says is true and right. As man goes on to describe the most minuscule of God's creation for their own purposes. They talk about the micro, they talk about the macro, and all of those to satisfy their own theories, their own interpretation of what is truth, all to their own ends. And if you hear anything this morning, I want you to hear this. We've got to stop believing people just because they got letters behind their name. We really do. Now, some would say, okay, so I'm not supposed to go to my doctor and believe my doctor. That's, you know, you, you do what you want with your doctor, but I would also say make sure you're 
looking into things on your own. But I'm not even talking about doctors. I'm talking more in these days about those that control so much of what we think, so much of what we believe, so much of what we're told is right and wrong. You know, we have many people, for instance, in the realm of science that will tell you they're not people of faith, which is a false thing. They have a faith. It's called scientism. They believe in what they believe. And much of it is there to prove that God didn't exist, or at least that he's wrong. And they're explaining what reality is to us. And they're giving us all of these insights into things that they're now discovering. And I'm here to tell you that so many of those insights, I can take you, because I've been there, back to the occult practices, about, back to the occult sciences, back to the ancient mystery schools. And I can show you that we're dealing with the same spirit that's always been there. And somehow it's wrapped in a new box with new paper and a new bow. And we're supposed to believe it's our Savior. There's only one Savior. And we need to measure everything by Him. You know, Romans chapter 5 verse 1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, though whom also we have access by faith into the grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not in man, not in man's ways. And you know, I think probably those of you that grew up in church, there was one bit of scripture that you probably memorized. And it spoke to us, but it probably spoke to us so often that we forgot how important, how, how piercing such a simple and poetic part of scripture can be. But I wanted us to listen to it this morning, and that's Psalm 23. And it says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. It tells us that we should fear no evil because we see Jesus as our shepherd, the true and good shepherd. And we need to know that because it tells us that we're walking through a valley of the shadow of death. And everything that is not of God is calling for us in a direction that would lead to death. Only God calls us to life and new life and to eternal life. We're told, fear no evil. And yet at the same time, we're to be aware of it. But the best best way to be aware of it is to be dependent upon the Holy Spirit to point it out. To stir our hearts and our minds to know this isn't of God. That voice is not God's. That thing is not of God. That place is not of God. Those thoughts I'm having are not of God. And then there's this picture which I want you to hold on to. And that's Jesus as our protector, our shepherd. And he speaks about the rod and the staff. One is an offensive tool. An offensive tool to move his sheep along. And I don't know if you've ever felt God's rod. I have. He seems to apply it to me often. And then he has the staff. And the staff was a symbol to the sheep to follow, for he was the shepherd. And yet it could also be used as a, as a tool the crook, to grab and to pull. I think I have marks if you want to see them. But I'm so thankful that he cares for me, just a sheep, just a simple sheep, just part of his flock. And he loves us all, each and every one. He rescues us from those things that come against us. Verse 3, For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. So he's saying, we that believe that call on Jesus as Lord and Savior are truly born of the Spirit. You know, so many things we study in the Old Testament we see revealed in the New Testament. It seems to be a symbol of something in the Old Testament. We get to the New Testament and we see how that thing spoke of Jesus 
I have one of those that I wasn't taught, but I feel the Lord laid it on my heart many years ago. And I'm not saying I'm absolutely right, but I carry it with me because it makes sense when I come to this topic of circumcision. Circumcision was given to the Jewish men to mark them as being, as belonging to God. And I believe in my heart what that was a picture of. I believe it was a picture of the once and for all cutting away of the flesh of man so that the, the Savior would be pure, although a human would be pure and not containing the sin of man. And I see that picture of circumcision fulfilled in that, if you will, last moment before Joseph might have become the earthly father. But yet the Holy Spirit comes in, comes upon Mary and gives birth to our Savior. And I believe what we see then is that sin of man being cut off, that that bloodline of man being cut off, that the purity of our Savior would be preserved at that moment. What a beautiful picture that God was sending us early on. And we need to be devoted to His pureness if we want to find that joy. And what are the marks of true devotion? And I would say devotion, you know, contrasting it with religion. What is true devotion? What would be worshiping God in spirit? It would be rejoicing in the Savior. And I would add having no confidence in the flesh. No confidence in the flesh. No confidence in what comes from the flesh, which takes us back to that Psalm 118.8. No confidence in the things of man. Because those three marks of true devotion are really in contrast to the marks of evil that Paul's given us here. The dogs, the evil workers, the mutilation. And he called those legalists and evil workers dogs because they ate of filth. And and which means they ate of what the world was giving them. In contrast, the true circumcision, those of us that by spirit have come to a saving faith in Jesus, we feed on God. Not on filth, not on flesh, not on the things of man. We feed on God. Jesus spoke to that. In John chapter 6, verse 53 and following, he said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood is eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. Now I want you to remember that those words were spoken to the crowds. They were spoken to the crowds after Jesus had fed the 5,000 on one side of the Galilee. He fed them and then he sent his disciples into the boat and out to sea. He joined them later, walking upon the water, which brought them to part of their saving faith, having seen that. But then they step out on the dry land. They meet the crowds again who were more interested in the fact that Jesus fed them physically than they were anything about the fact that he was the Messiah and the Son of God. And then he spoke these words. He spoke these words to him. Because they were focused on the wrong thing. They were focused on the flesh. They were focused on their stomachs and their own physical needs. But you know, we come together in what we call a worship service. We come together and we have great fellowship and we worship in song and we spend time in prayer. We spend time with praise. We spend time in the word. And all of that, if your heart is right, you'd understand you're feeding on God. You're feeding on God. It is interesting, when we take in what is healthy, our body tends to expel what is not. And so we have to understand and see that that's the process that we're in. And a life of worship would then be continuously feeding on Him. But here's the warning. When Jesus spoke those words, later on in that same chapter, it said this, Therefore many of His disciples, when they heard this, said, this is a hard saying. Who can understand it? And then a little bit later, it says, from that time, many of his disciples went back 
and walked with him no more. Jesus offers of himself to feed our very souls, to bring our spirits into new life and eternal life. And he says, feed on that. Take that in, that you might be satisfied, that your hunger would not be for things other than me. But it is a difficult statement, and it's difficult to do. Because this goes right along with the fact that we need to die to ourselves, that his life might live through us. Verse 4 of our text, Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised the eighth day, of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. So in those verses, Paul has confidence in his ancestry, in his orthodoxy, in his activity, in his morality. And we could go into each of those in depth. I'm not going to this morning. But he points to all that, all of that to say if Anyone should have confidence in their flesh. It's me. So he uses himself as an example. Because he knew in his audience there weren't many that could contend with his lineage. And so he offers that as a contrast. But then he goes on to explain further, verse 7, But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. These words that he uses in that verse 7 in the Greek are really kind of a business analogy. And it's talking about profit and loss. And what he's saying there, if we can visualize it, is he moved everything from the profit column over to the loss column. And in the next verses that we're going to come to, we'll see that all that was accrued to him as profit in that column was was, only came after he emptied it. Because he was taking the things of the spirit that were working in his lives and not the things he gained through his own fleshly and human life. So look at what he gained, verse 8. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. Now what he says is when he moved all of those things to the lost column, that he gained Christ, that he found him. Not his own righteousness, but the righteousness of Jesus And he talked about the power that came in, the power of the resurrection, which speaks of the Holy Spirit, who is the power of the resurrection. And then he joined in with the fellowship of the sufferings that Christ partook, which many would say, wait a minute, isn't that a loss? And God's word is clear. No, it's a gain. But we're told in Scripture in more than one place that we gain by losing, that the last become first. It turns our human earthly logic on its head, but from heaven, if we understand it, it makes total sense. And really, it all, it's all about turning from ourselves to him. Romans chapter 10, verse 3, it says, For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. And only by death of self does that come. Listen to these words from Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23 and 4. It says, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. But we need to remember that as we lose ourselves, we profit. We profit by moving the direction of our God-given design, including, we're told, the mind of Christ. If we can accept that mind of Christ to think like Him, then we'll be on the right side of this Verse 12, Paul makes sure that he's 
humble in the light of what he's attained. And we can all join with him in this set of verses, verse 12 and verse 13. He says, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. He says he's not attained, he's not perfected, but he's pressing on, he's laying hold. Laying hold of what? Well, the things for which he was saved. It's the same things that we're to lay hold of. The the reasons that God saved us. What is that? It's the good work that he began in all of us. And that he'll be faithful to complete until the day of Christ Jesus. We're to know Christ. We're to be like Christ. We're to be all Christ intended us to be. And then we're to share it with the world. That's what we're being asked. That's the promise that we have. But to realize that we're not done. That we're on a journey. And that's okay. And part of that process every day is understanding what we've brought into the mix that's of us, of man, of the world, that needs to be done away with so we can gain all the more of the Lord and what He wants to give to us. Verse 15 It says, therefore, let us as many are as mature have this mind, as if in anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. What's that mind? What's that mind we're to have? It's the mind of Christ. But here in particular, what Paul's talking about, it's an attitude, an attitude to race, not to drop out. And it's a race, not that we're to beat one another, but we're to run the race that God's given us. We're to win the race that God's given us. You know, I think we're to do everything that God's called us to, but I don't think we're to grow weary in doing good as the scripture says. I don't think we're supposed to crawl into heaven. Some would say, you know, you need to spend everything that you have. And some might even say, you know, to the point where you're crawling into heaven. No, I I would take from Paul's words here that we're to be upright, chest out, breaking the tape as we cross that line into heaven. Because we did it in such a way that we did it in His strength and we did it with His Spirit. So that's an attitude, that mind that it speaks of. And it says, and if in anything you think otherwise, and really the picture there in the Greek is that we're dragging the weight of the past. Anything that we would hold on to from the past that would slow us down that would cause us not to be fully available to God or things we're to do away with, we're to cast off, we're to ask Him to remove. And I know that's hard. I know there's many of us that hold on to things of our past. And it's human nature. But we need to ask ourselves and we need to ask God, what's the cost of that? What, what is the limiting factor of those things that we hold on to? Because it's so hard to be as Great as God would ask us to be in the day that we exist if we got one foot in the past and going along with that too often is another foot in the future. And we're totally off balance for today. One foot in the past, one in the future. That's that's an odd stance. Try it. You're not very secure. It's easy to knock you off your feet. But if you get the foot out of the past and the foot out of the future and you put them both in today, which is truly, truly the only day God's given you, The only day you have is this one. I can't promise you tomorrow. I can't bring back yesterday. But you have this day. And so bring those feet together in this day and see what God's going to do. God here, it talks about him being the supreme coach. And if we pray, he'll reveal these things to us. Verse 16, Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule Let us be of the same mind. We've spoken about this in previous chapters. We spoke about it a lot in Ephesians. This fact that we're to have this unity. A unity that starts with God. Us and God. Each of us with God. That unity. Then extending to us collectively as a body with God. And then the unity that that then brings between each of us with one another. 
And then look at 17. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. Now that unity comes, I believe, and it's fulfilled, I believe, by God's presence when we're walking not only with one another, but we're walking rightly. And there are those amongst us that we count as mature believers. We see the evidence of their faith in their, in their life. And I believe it's to them we need to look. It's them we need to look, we need to model ourselves, we need to learn from. It's a discipleship. Something, sadly, it's missing in so much of the church today. You know, that's old, the old thing I've heard so many times, that each of us should be being discipled by somebody and discipling someone. And it's a hard arrangement to make, and yet the wisdom is apparent. But you know, so often, the person that you're to be discipled by isn't, because you haven't asked them. They don't know necessarily they're supposed to disciple you. Very often, we find that out. We look at someone, we, we feel what God's showing us in that person, and we're thinking, man, I need what they have. I need to learn what they know. I need to walk like they're walking. I I need that example. And sometimes what we need to do is humble ourselves and go to that person and say, I need to be discipled by you. I need to hear from you. I need to share your life. And so I, I just bring that as an encouragement because I think many of us need discipling. Many of us need to be in a position of discipling others. Be wary, though, of wrong examples. Because there are those two. God tells us that there are tares amongst the wheat. Which means that even in our fellowship, even even amongst brothers and sisters, there are those that we shouldn't follow. And God says, don't pluck up those tares because the wheat will come with it. That's for him to do. And so we just need to be those that are wise. Our discernment needs to be keen. But we need to be those that could be accounted as mature. Now, not everybody starts off mature. Matter of fact, none of us really starts off mature in the faith. And then we seem to excel at different speeds depending on how God works with us and just our nature. But where I get concerned is those that think they can rest where they began. And none of us are to rest where we began. We're to move on to maturity. We're to become those students of the word the practicers of those Christian disciplines that are really simple but yet hard to do and maintain in our lives. And so I just encourage you, follow the good examples. Shun those that don't seem to be edifying to you. Not the person, just the example. Because we need to love on all. And then verse 18 of our text, Paul says, For many walk, of whom I have told you often, And now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. So there again in those verses we see the warning. He even brings the warning with tears, which I believe should be an indication of how deeply Paul meant this. And I think there's times that we should weep for what we see that our our reaction should be so strong that we would weep for the infractions against our faith and for those that take it in a wrong direction. I want us to take those four words in verse 18 very seriously, enemies of the cross. And to speak of that, I'm going to go back just briefly to something I began to say moments ago. And I just want you to know that the enemies of the cross are not necessarily but definitely not always, those that would just stand up and cast a shadow over your faith. It's not just the ones that would say that Jesus isn't Lord or, or, or that God isn't real or that you Christians are this or that. I mean, all of those, I guess, would be enemies of the cross, those that would deny who Jesus said he was and what Jesus did. But beyond that, there's enemies of the cross that have influenced us to think differently than what even Scripture teaches. Chuck kind of mentioned it during prayer and praise time. There are things that have creeped in. There are beliefs that we have because the world has countermanded the things of God. And we need to review what we believe. And we need to take it to the Word. 
in the most mundane things, we need to understand whether it's true by God's word or not. Because there are things, and I go back to this religion called scientism. I, I bring up the fact that they're trying to help us evolve to the next level with technology. That they're trying to influence us at the very biological level. They're doing all these things, and we can scoff, and we can say, oh, it's not really that bad, or is that really happening? I'm here to tell you it is, and it will, and it's growing. And I used to get nervous about talking to the congregation about these things, and the only thing I'm nervous about today is not saying enough. Because we have been invaded. The church, Christians, we have been invaded. There are so many things that we look into the Bible and we would be wrong to say that's not literal. That, that's probably just poetry. I mean, I mean, God wouldn't say that. I mean, God wouldn't mean that. I, I take the word of God more literal every day. And you know Why? Because I take the lie of the enemy more literal every day. And again, I say, we don't know how evil evil is. We don't know truly in a heart of hearts what it means that Satan is the prince of this world. But where do we start? We start with understanding that Jesus is king. And that God sits on the throne. And that he is sovereign. And that he saves and that he is bigger and greater and more powerful than anything we face. But that doesn't discount the influence of the enemy. He's nowhere, he's not even in league. You, know, try, you try to make that horrible analogy. Well, you, you know, God, Jesus, Satan's not equal with God. I mean, duh. But yet, how strongly we do react to that unequal character. How many things have we been captured by? How many things are we accepting today by man's wisdom, by man's knowledge, by man's intellect? We're being driven so fast into a wastebasket of what could be if, if, if everyone just attached themselves to the truth of the word. Science is taking us in a very dangerous direction. Science has decided things that are just flat out not true. And almost in every case, they are counter to God. It's an affront to God. It's an attack to God and God's creation. Most of us in this room grew up when science was taught with the word theory. You remember that? It was taught with the word theory. Theory doesn't exist anymore. Everything is fact. And it's not true in almost, well, in too many cases. And you may have no knowledge of what I'm talking about. Well, let's talk. I don't have the time to take you, and you'll be glad, to take you. But I'll, I'll tell you this, and I didn't plan on telling you this. I, I've been praying real hard, and I, and I spoke with a brother last week, just kind of trying to figure out, kind of hear myself think. You, know, you, you already know, and I've been given one officially, that I, that I wear a tinfoil hat. Because I talk about things that seem fringe, I talk about things that people say, well, isn't that a conspiracy theory? I, and to which I ask, are there any more conspiracy theories? But I'm to the point now where I feel that I need to tell you more about at least what I believe to be true. That I need to take the risk, and it is a risk, to lay out before you where I think we're at and what I think we're being attacked by and what the lies are. Because most of you don't have time or you don't have the interest. And I'm not judging you in that. It's just the truth to dig as far as I dig. But here's the thing. I don't want to impress you with my knowledge. What I want to do is wake you up to what just very well may rip you off. Because there are things coming down the pike that are happening right now that are just poised to steal our kids, to steal our grandkids. And this is nothing new. It's just wrapped up in way more shinier packages. And they're, and, they're, and they're giving it to us in a way that we all want part of it. And it's why the things that, we're talked, that are talked about in Revelation that we wonder, how do we get from here to there? Well, we're getting from here to there right now. 
And there really is no there, to be honest with you. It's all here. It's just a matter of how it's going to be introduced. And it's being introduced very quickly. And we need to be wise. We need to be wise. And so I think sometime in the new year, we're going to take a couple evenings, and, and you're invited to come, and I'm going to lay out a lot of things, and hopefully you'll come back. That's all I can say. But there's so many things that I, I just don't feel as a watchman on the wall, I have the right to sit on. And you be the judge. And you can be the judge. Verse 20 and 21, as we finish, and here's our great reminder that Paul gives us, and it really, really should just grab our hearts. And if I could be so direct, it should really grab our chins and shove our eyes upward. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. We are told at the end of Matthew in chapter 28 that everything, all things, nothing excluded, were placed under the feet of our Lord. And it was because of that and the fact that he lives in us that believes that we were told then, go, go. Go and baptize and teach and make disciples. But it was because he owns everything. He had subdued everything in the cross and from the grave. And so we need to look to him as that ever presence power in our life. And we need to look to heaven to understand that that's where home is. And if that's where home is, we need to be cautious to make our bed here. We need to be cautious to have our favorite chair here. We need to be waiting upon that. And here's what I don't want you to think. I don't want you to think that this life is to be miserable. Because we're told to have joy. We're told to be glad. We're told to celebrate, to rejoice. And we are. Why? Because our citizenship is in heaven and not here. And because he's coming back one day to get us. And we all pray it soon. We're going to come now to the communion table. And I, again, I know it's late, so I just ask that you'd bear with the hour and just put your heart into this time as we rest before the Lord's table and just review, recall, if you will, the cup that speaks of Jesus' blood, the forgiving blood, so much about the blood we've been studying on Wednesday nights. Lord, so glad, Lord, that we don't have to bring the bulls and the, and the doves and the, the animals and bleed them out, Lord, that you were the perfect sacrifice that died once and for all, that we might have forgiveness of sins and that body broken for us. That the Lord, in the midst of that Passover meal, would point to that cup, that cup of redemption, and say that this is my body that I was broken for you. This is my blood that I bled for your forgiveness. We need to start there if we're going to get to the joy that he promised. We have to start with what he did, what he came to do, what he promised to do, and what he did. How he fulfilled his great love for us. Ushers, come up. Lord, we turn to you now, Lord, at the communion table. and We were so blessed. We're so blessed, Lord, and we're just not deserving yet. You continue to love us, to pursue us, to woo us into your presence. Lord, you are so good. Your love is everlasting, Lord. Lord, we all want to find the joy that you promise. We all want to rejoice in calling you Lord and Savior. And Lord, I pray, Lord, for the one that may be here today, Lord, that doesn't know you, that hasn't called upon you, that hasn't laid down the flesh, Lord, and picked up the spirit that you promised, Lord, 
doesn't welcome that indwelling presence and that hope of heaven and eternity with you. Lord, you don't condemn us when you call us sinners. Lord, you remind us that we need you. And so, Lord, for that brother, for that sister that might be here this morning that's wrestled with that, Lord, I pray that you would bend their will to your own. They would receive you today, that they would pray out during this time and ask, Lord, that they be forgiven, that they would call upon you as Lord and Savior, that they would come to know you personally, Lord. And Lord, I know to do that, they have to leave go of the past. They have to quit worrying about the future, as all of us do, Lord. And just be present, as you were present, Lord, in this one day, this one moment that you've given us. Let us use it, Lord, to praise you. And we do so in Jesus' name.